Government Hack Night. <laughs> which, list, which one is this again? It's 109, is it? I believe it's 109. We, got, we have a page for that. Here we go. Events. And then this one. Here we go. You are here. So just in case you weren't sure, this is this is the Open Up Hack Night, and this is the topic for tonight. So we're going to have uh, two awesome presentations from uh, Stephen Vance from Street Plug Chicago and general Hack Night uh, aficionado guy. Uh, and then uh, Tina Bassett from the uh, DePaul Institute for Housing Studies. Uh, we're going to talk about building permits and sort of the, some of the different uses uh, that these two, uh, two folks have uh, come up with. Um, but before we get into that, uh, we like to go around the room and very quickly everybody introduce themselves, just say your name and what you're interested in, uh, why you're here. Uh, and then uh, we'll have a brief period for announcements uh, so people can like announce uh, projects or events or things that are related to open government, open data, uh, civic innovation. And then after that, we can all kind of go off and work on other stuff. Um, tonight is also a special event because it is our first uh, open leadership council meeting. So anybody who wants to be involved in sort of running this event or being uh, more active in this community as far as uh, you know, working on more projects or trying to onboard more people, uh, or if you have ideas yourselves, uh, this is your chance, uh, although there will be many more in the future, uh, but this is your first chance to uh, be part of a discussion. Uh, so that will be after the presentations. Uh, uh, this will be another working group. And, and if you don't want to be any part of that, that's fine. Um, I honestly don't think it would work very well if everybody wanted to. I mean, it could be interesting, right? But uh, anyway, so uh, uh, I suppose we'll get to uh, uh, introductions. Uh, my name is Derek Eater. I'm uh, with DataMain. I'm one of the organizers for this event. Um, I'm a web developer who likes to make stuff with open data. My name is Christopher Whitaker. I am the Midwest uh, Brigade Coordinator for Code for America. Uh, I'm Josh, um, an open data person uh, working on Cook County's open data. Frank Fitzgerald, a curious old guy. <laughs> uh, I'm Tim, I'm just sort of here to see what this is. I'm Sheila, I am marketing and media, and I am very interested in the built environment and architecture we do there. Hi, my name is Paula. I'm from Family Resource Center on Disabilities. Um, my interest is in technology, accessibility, and disability. I'm Asma. I'm here for two reasons. One, I live in Uptown, and um, we've got a lot of issues going on with uh, um, not so open government. And uh, <laughs> I also run an open source software institute. Um, and so um, a friend of mine said I should come and check you guys out. Uh, I'm Tina. Uh, I'm for a real estate company, and I'm interested in finding out as much as I can on what real estate data is out there. So. Um, I'm Jeff Carpenter. I work for a logistics company, and I do some programming in SQL and C Sharp, and I'm looking for more experience and also to grow. I'm Gene Linus. I've uh, been here a few times, but not for a while. I work with the city now, and actually we're working on uh, projects that are very related to this. My boss is, I'll let him introduce himself, but he's in here. Um, and. Uh, uh, I also do some consulting on the side for uh, through my company, Chicago Data Science. <laughs> I'm Ravi, and I'm just uh, more interested in how um, I don't know, just open hack government around community. Just say you get the burritos. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Um, my name is Lauren. I recently graduated with uh, my master's in applied statistics, and so I really like data, so I feel like this is the place to be. <laughs> Hi, my name is Johnny, and I am here for my first time. I'm just hoping to learn something. I'm David Ginsberg. I'm a software engineer here in Chicago, and uh, this week I'm particularly interested in the meta discussion about open uh, As a scientist. <laughs> I'm Audrey, and I am a project manager for a startup leadership development company, and I also am teaching myself data science on the site. Randy, and he stole my old guy line. <laughs> 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 you gotta go with something yeah, different. Uh, so I'm like, I'm like Python? 
and old people like assess accessibility, and I do that with, uh, I try to do that with CTA uh, bus and blue and brown line data. Uh, other, other lines too. <laughs> I'm Corinne. I'm a math and computer science student. Hi, I'm Steve. Uh, I do GIS work for the city of here in Indiana. And we've been doing a lot of work with demolitions and building permits type work. And I'm interested in getting more involved, so it's like a perfect storm to be here. <laughs> I'm Samantha. I am interested in historic preservation, affordable housing, and data. Hi, and I'm Tracy Siska from the Chicago Justice Project. We work on open government, open data for crime and violence stuff. Hi, I'm Mel, and I'm a Microsoft Civic Engagement Fellow. Hi, I'm Gavin, and I work with Mel at Microsoft. I'm Nick, a web developer and map maker, so I'm interested in that sort of thing. Hi, I'm Diego. Um, I'm in financial systems, and I'm interested in helping you on your project, whatever it may be. Hi, I'm Paul. I work in software integrations, and I'm interested in GIS data. I'm Chris. I'm a reporter with Playing Easy. Paul, uh, also Paul, uh, also a little guy, interested mainly as an amateur in government. Hi, uh, Tina. I'm interested in this kind of data because where you live. I'm Chris Ben. I'm a web developer. Uh, <coughs> Long time in Chicago in and always looking stuff to hack on the service. I'm Kevin. I'm an instructor from University of Illinois down south, Champaign and Champaign. And I saw the show City Big Data Open Santa Fe Building, and it's really fascinating. I'm hoping to be able to talk to people about that and develop some kind of a you know understanding of where the system goes, where it might go. <laughs> I am Andy Kutanka. I am just a big fan of this. Uh, and I try to come here as often as possible. And I also follow some of Stephen's work. And I just kind of want to see what he's presenting on. Uh, so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, my name is Stephen. I'm a transportation reporter for Street Blog Chicago. And you will hear from me later. My name is Ryan. I'm interested in the building industry. I'm here for Hey, I'm Warren. I'm a software developer. I recently made an app for Chicago for street cleaning. And uh, uh, to learn more about uh, open data. Yeah. I'm Brett. I do transportation modeling. My name is Lisa. I actually work as a psychometrician, which means I analyze high stakes medical and dental certification exams to make sure that they produce valid, reliable results. And I guess I'm interested in seeing if. My skill set might be transferable. Learn more. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm Scott, and my job's not nearly that exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a software developer. <laughs> I'm Dan. I work for a Chicago uh, environmental nonprofit called the Delta Institute on um, data and maps and that type of thing. Uh, my name is Morgan Waters. I work on political campaigns. I'm just here to learn as much as I can. <laughs> I'm going to swing back over here. Um, I'm Pear. I run a company called uh, Pakistan. We do a lot of matching with the data issues. My turn. Hi, I'm Michelle Larmer. Uh, I build things. And I also have a background in planning and design. I... Hi, uh, everybody. I'm Nick Hill. I work at uh, Mathematica Policy Research. Um, doing a lot of program evaluation work. Most of you run. Uh, education and property. Just saying, there's a few chairs up here. Yeah. Uh, you're interested in sitting. There's at least four. Five. <laughs> open chair. Uh, I'm Evan Roser. I work at the Center for Neighborhood Technology. It's a think tank here in Chicago that focuses on uh, sort of urban sustainability. And I uh, run a project called Transit Future. I manage the campaign and I'm putting together a rap's competition. I'll get a lot about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, the sample, I'm with Illinois Health Matters, and last week, two weeks ago, I found out that Ed Ozer and I can communicate in Russian, which was very cool. <laughs> uh, last week, I asked Derek a really stupid question, and now all my charts are working. <laughs> uh, my name is Tom. I'm the director of analytics for the city of Chicago. I run the Open Data Portal, Arcane Analytics, Business Intelligence, and Database Management. 
Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm at the Experimental Station Food Justice and Food Science Academy. I'm Molly. I'm a software developer here at the Health Project. My name is Michael. Um, I'm also a software developer and want to see what's, what this is all about. I'm Richard. I'm a developer that works just here because it's the place of I'm Steve. I'm also a developer that works and I'm interested in uh, health and education. So. I'm working at Pulse Developer Networks, um, and I'm interested in helping us. Uh, Carmen, Visit City of Chicago, Sparkling Innovation and Technology. I am interested in everything that has to do with the city and building comments on best enough place something that I get excited about. <laughs> 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 I'm a friend of Carmen. My name's Joe, and uh, she told me this was the best place to be tonight, so uh, I'm excited to come along. There's nothing going on tonight. Gorilla truck show is happening. Our club here. I've been teaching that order for the people's pizza award. I'm like, oh. <laughs> um, my name is Eric. I, I work, I'm a web developer. <laughs> uh, my name is Forrest Greg. I'm a, I'm a partner at Dave my name is Tian Fassett, and I work at the Institute for Housing Studies at DePaul University, and I'll be presenting in a minute. Great. All right. Well, uh, as usual, very awesome and diverse group. Uh, anybody have announcements they would like to share with the group? This could be events or uh, jobs or uh, apps you want to talk about. Ed? Yeah. I got. It. So I got a couple things. So um, we are <coughs> is, uh, putting together our third. Annual apps competition. And what that is is basically we get people together who are uh, coders, who are designers, who are data folks, um, and we also get people together who are leaders in different communities around the city who don't necessarily have a tech background but are super knowledgeable about the issues in their neighborhoods. And we team them up, put them together, and sort of facilitate a process whereby they come up with ideas for technological solutions to long standing urban problems. Um, and so it's a three week process and it starts on Tuesday evenings. Next Tuesday, ostensibly, somewhere at 1870. Actually, it's a mystery. Uh, so we have to start to find out. But there'll be a time with this event. And so it's 6 p.m. Yeah. Tuesday, somewhere in the city, uh, next week. And then the weekend after, the week after that, Tuesday the 24th, here at 1871. And then the weekend after that, the 27th, 28th, and 29th, is sort of more traditional hackathon style event. At Technex in the Lyric Opera Building. So it's going to be super sweet, two gigs free beer, and come to us some really cool and really interesting and really long standing, really difficult problem. And if you've got an idea, if you're a long, if you're really like gnarly coder, if you're not, come check it out and learn how to solve some problems. And I've got super sweet flyers. <laughs> um, the other thing I want to talk about real quick, uh, Transit Future, I'm a campaign manager for this, and it's a campaign to build new bus and rail rapid transit lines in Cook County. Well, I'm aiming for about a $20 billion investment in our public transit system. Uh, so what you can go here is you can check out the vision of what the transit system will look like. It's built by a certain, tremendously has a gentleman over there by the name of Nick Duarron. And uh, uh, you can also sign the petition to sort of help us make it happen. We're going to have a bunch of different levels on this. This is really important. Yeah, there it is. Take action. You go to, and that's, that's the website that uh, Nick helped out. Him and this guy, Juan, who deserted us for New York. Cool. Uh, other announcements? Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, we don't have to Yeah, okay. Um, I'm Per. I run a company called Packets In. We're one of this, uh, this year's Techstars companies. Uh, we're hiring a lead developer um, and uh, like to hear more about some of the engineering problems we've got. Come talk to me. Uh, unlike a lot of startups, people pay us money for our thing and uh, <laughs> uh, therefore we have money. Um, so uh, if, uh, if jumping into an early stage opportunity is something you just wanted to do, come, come find me after. Thanks. Um, I just want to, uh, we're, I went to collection space, uh, we're an open source software application that museums, museum professionals have designed and built for themselves for managing collections. Um, everything from artifacts to um, 
We're hiring three software engineers, so if anybody's interested in working with museum data, talk to me. Hey, I'm uh, I made an app uh, called Carpal for the city of Chicago. Uh, it helps you avoid parking tickets, uh, for street cleaning by reminding you when to move your car. Um, we recently launched our Android version a couple weeks ago, and uh, you know, uh, if you've ever got a street ticket, uh, street parking ticket in Chicago for street cleaning, uh, definitely check out our app. It's free. It's available both on iOS and Android, and I have some slides. What's the name of the app? Carpal. I love that app. Oh, thank you. It has a nice feature like a parking meter, so if you set your, it'll give you the time and it'll tell you when the parking meter to do expire. Yeah. It's a really great app. Yeah, it's the second one. Yeah. Cool. Carpal. Carpal. Yeah. Very cool. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, is anyone learning how to use Git and GitHub? Yeah. Yes. Have you ever like made a mistake and want to like undo that? Like it never happened. Yeah. <laughs> you like or specifically <laughs> focusing. So there's this pro this project that I did a couple weeks ago called Git JK. So if you do something in Git and you want to like say, oh wait, I didn't really need to do that, you do Git JK and it just automatically undoes whatever that thing is that you just did. Uh, it doesn't do that with everything in life, so that should definitely be a new feature. Um, I'll open an issue. Yeah. Oh, you have, yeah, yeah, but you have to have uh, Node.js installed, so we're trying to like, forward that movement there. So now you have two problems. Can you download that? Just GitHub. GitHub JK? Yeah. Just Google it, GitHub JK. Uh, other announcements? Uh, I have one. Uh, um, so I'm proud to announce that the Midwest has been selected as the pilot region for the Code for America Brigade. Um, starting, uh, and I'm going to be helping Code for America to help uh, manage the Code for America Brigade in the Midwest. Um, in 2012, the Code for America Brigade started with 12 cities, so we literally fit around a conference table. Now we have captains and organizers in 53 cities, so it's gotten a little cumbersome to manage, all from San Francisco. And so they're wanting to implement a pilot for a regional brigade. So the, all the cities report to a regional coordinator who then reports to San Francisco. Uh, the Midwest will be a pilot, so there will be some, some more groups like this popping up in cities around the Midwest, uh, specifically uh, uh, Gary, Indiana, uh, building up the Rockford Brigade, uh, connecting with the Code for America brigades that already exist um, in Detroit, Twin Cities, um, Grand Rapids, and some other places. And so I just want to let you all know that the Midwest is best. Other <laughs> <laughs> uh, announcements? Well, all right, then. I suppose without further ado, then we'll get to our presentations. Uh, Stephen, are you going to go first? Yeah. All right. So uh, Stephen Vance and licensed Chicago contractors. Do you want me to kill for time? No, no we'll just pause it. Do you want me to steer it? You have a podium. Do that, right? <laughs> 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 I have a tweet. It's in the job description. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to talk about the built environment. So as the title tonight is tracking the built environment with building permits. And I'm also going to talk about a tool that I built uh, so you can see what people are building or also what people are demolishing but also what people are renovating. And that's uh, kind of what the information that the building permits have. <clears throat> But 
figuring out what's going on in this photo is mm -hmm. not why I built the tool. Like I didn't just you know run around the city and be like, oh, what's going on over here? What construction is happening? I don't know. Can anyone tell me where this is? Yeah. Do you know what the name of the development is? City. Who said that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So it's New City. Like I didn't have this urge to to understand exactly what was being built, but I built a tool that can now tell you that. And because usually every uh, for the people who have been coming here as long as I have, you know that I usually talk about transportation and bicycles. Yeah. And like so, this has nothing to do with that. Um, Oh, do you have a? Oh, I guess you have to control it. Okay, yeah. See, this is me talking about Divi. You know, uh, these two guys came from city, the city and Divi, to talk about uh, the bike share system and all the data that uh, the bikes are generating as people use them. And here I am, like moderating it because I was also showing off some people's uh, apps and uh, tools and websites. And they announced that they were going to have a, a competition to do something cool with the data. And then we had a follow-up meeting a month after. So yeah, that's. Setting the background that usually all I talk about is bicycles. <laughs> uh, next. <laughs> okay, actually, I guess I'm still going to talk about bicycles. <laughs> uh, so, my friend Ryan in the back, who said he's here to root for me, he and I are designing a bike rack. And this is a bike rack, but not the one we're designing. I just wanted to show you how cool bike racks can be. You know, all these people are hanging around them. This is at Kuma's Corner, you know, so it's actually a really popular place. Anyway, uh, I live down the street. Um, and so we're designing this bike rack, and, you know, uh, this is two months, uh, this is in March, and I, I'm preparing for my trip to, my one month trip to Europe. I'm trying to get all these things done before I go. One of them is to put the application in to install the bike rack on a sidewalk in the city of Chicago. And I got it done. I got the application in. I actually forgot to call today and say, where's what's the status of my application? But the last, the next step after I get the permit approved is I have to find someone to install it for me. I have to find a contractor that's licensed to do work in the public way. And so I Googled that, you know, public way contractor, and I came across the city of Chicago's website that talks about, you know, the process of getting stuff installed in the public way and that you need this contractor. I'm like, okay, where's the list of the contractors I can pick from? Well, it doesn't exist. And the reasoning that I got when I called the, the office that you know gives out the, these permits is that they don't want to make it seem that they're preferring one contractor over another. Like maybe the list, if it's in alphabetical order, everyone's going to pick the first or second one. And that might be seen as preferring one over the other. And so I said, well, I don't know who to pick then. Like they said, oh well, and I don't know who is licensed because they do have a. Do I just go? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm slacking. Yeah. Actually, here's a picture of the waiting room to <laughs> get your permit in <laughs> or your application in. Uh, it actually worked out really well. This is the city's small business center, and it was pretty smooth. You get a. a, a uh, a ticket. You, I waited for probably half an hour. I was expecting like two hours. Like I blocked off two hours of my time that day, but I was in there and out in 45 minutes. Um, so yeah, I needed to find this uh, this contractor. Um, and so the city has a list of the general contractors, but that doesn't. Oh yeah, you know me calling people uh, in New York City actually. Uh, <laughs> Um, but so this go down one more. So the city has this list of the general contractors, and so I, and I'm like, okay, this is a starting point, I guess. You know, I can one of these people are probably additionally licensed to do work in the public way. And then I asked, well, how do I know? And they said, well, you can ask us. I'm like, so I'm going to ask you four thousand times: Is this con uh, company <laughs> licensed to do work in the public way? Is this company? And so I mean, I just got overwhelmed with. Uh, uh, a little bit too stressed, so I kind of, you know, gave up for a few days. But then I thought, I looked at this list, and this list is awful. Like, I, I think I can do better. I can make a better list. Uh, like, one of the issues is that you can't sort by anything. You can't search it. Um, you would click on the number, and I'm like, oh, maybe I want to share page two with someone. The links aren't permanent. All links go to the first page. Like, 
oh, this is really awful. And and so I, I redesigned it. And actually, I'm not even going to show you the redesign anymore because I've already already moved on. Uh, <laughs> because that day not your just contract. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, see ya. <laughs> uh, I thought that this list isn't, even if I remake the list and it's now a much, in a much more useful form, it's still not that useful or interesting to people. So I thought, what other data is available that I can use to, you know, make something useful? That was the next step, I thought. Um, so move down one, or next. Um, and so browsing around the city's uh, data portal, open data portal, where they have all this machine-readable data about, oh, I don't know, there's probably like 600 data sets now. Yeah, and um, one of them is a list of building permits. Uh, I probably should have sorted it by date when I took this screenshot. Um, so right now, this permit is about an elevator equipment and they paid a $52.50 fee to get the permit. It's usually just uh, an inspection sometimes. It's not even like to upgrade the elevator or anything. Um, so I started a script that starts copying all the data over once an hour. Um, and they're sorted by date, so you can easily see which ones you've already copied uh, next. So this is the website as it looks right now. Um, and so it starts off with the most recently issued permits, and if they're on the same day, then it uh, sorts by price, or I mean by estimated uh, construction cost. And you can see that this one at 11 South LaSalle in the financial district is $56 million. And they're like, oh, well, what's going on over there? And so then you just, you know, click here or, or here or here even, and they'll tell you, oh, it's a new Marriott hotel. That's cool. <laughs> OK, so you can also see, oh, go back one. You know, uh, because of all this information, all these keywords that people might search for, all these company names, I noticed it was getting a lot of traffic. I actually wasn't even doing much to you know, attract that traffic. It was just people Googling words that my website had a, mentioned a lot of, and so, you know, I threw up a few ads. <laughs> and this one's obviously a retargeting ad because I was looking for a new speaker system. <laughs> um, and I'm also working on a paid subscription service, but uh, that's still coming up. Um, okay, now I'll go to the next one. So, and then I thought, okay, you know, I want to be able to show people what a, like a snapshot of what's going on. Uh, go to the next one. And so I built this dashboard. Um, and so you can see, like, uh, yeah, today's activity so far. It's funny because sometimes the building permit data updates several times throughout the day. Sometimes it doesn't update until the end of the day. Um, so, I mean, that's why you only see two so far. And I took this screenshot at, like, 4 PM today. Um, but later tonight, it'll you know be more like this: 130 permits, and and very quickly you can see that oh, there's the most expensive one from yesterday. Uh, all the projects added together, all of their estimated construction costs are 85 million dollars. So the city permitted 85 million dollars worth of construction yesterday, um, and those are all estimates provided by the applicant. So the city doesn't, the, to my knowledge, doesn't verify it because there's a an application, and you just kind of like fill in the blanks, um, and then uh, you can barely see it here. Uh, active neighborhoods. So every every address is geocoded to a ward. Uh, Nina, you know, you have four hundred dollars in, in permits fees for two jobs that are only a hundred dollars. It's good that you noticed that. So actually, at the bottom of this page, so this is just a screenshot, but on the dashboard, you can actually see all the permits that were waived, or that had their fees waived. And it's usually the public schools, but also uh, what's called the easy permit process. And that's kind of there's a category of construction and renovation that you can uh, that can go through the easy permit process. So you get less review because the the severity of your project or the safety of it is not that significant. 
Um, and if you kind of come prepared, it'll be easy for you and the city, and they seem to be more likely to waive the fee. Um, oh, so you can track um, by ward, by community area. Community area is a permanent uh, boundary that University of Chicago researchers developed when? Um, uh, community areas. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then also neighborhoods. And the neighborhood, I got this shape file. A shape file is a, a, is a, a I don't know how to describe a shape file. <laughs> I've never had to do that before. <laughs> Uh, it's a file that outlines 200 something neighborhoods in Chicago that the city of Chicago, some uh, I don't know how they put it together, but they don't publish that anymore. Yes, the original the original list came from University uh, it came from UIC, uh, and then they sued the city uh, because they said that it was their intellectual property, and then the case has come up with their own neighborhood list. Okay, I think I'm using. UIC's list. That's possible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's a, it's a kind of a funny list because there's a neighborhood called West Loop Gate, but not a neighborhood called West Loop. And there is no community area called West Loop. There's the near west side. And so when you when you go to the places page and there's like 400 places to choose from, then you start typing and it starts you know filtering to pick the one or to show you the results. And you like type in West Loop, and you're like, but none of those are the ones I want. Well, if you just click on one, it'll then tell you what all the ones that uh, surround it. So you can kind of uh, go through the city, you know, just a boundary by boundary. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, go to the next one. So here's another photo of the same new city development. Um, and then go to the next one. And so here is the permit that goes with that photo. So new 19-story residential tower with core and shell only. So, and okay, this is a mistake. You know, it's not the RIA store. I'm trying to do some uh, automated building name thing, and it's obviously failing a little bit. Um, but here you go, 63 million. $63 million. They paid a $99,000 uh, permit fee, which you know I just threw in the automated. Um, it was 0.16% of the estimated construction cost. Um, you can see the architect, John B. Talty. If you click on his name, it'll show you all the other permits that are associated with him. Um, power Construction Company um, is one of the top 20. Yes. You know, and maybe a, a, a data journalist would want to look into why. <laughs> uh, and then you can see the other the names of the other companies involved in this. Um, what's unfortunate, or not unfortunate, but something I want to work on is that. Nowhere does the word new city or the phrase new city appear in here. So if you're searching for new city, it won't show up. You have to know that it has that address. Um, eventually, I want to put up a tag system where people could like suggest what's happening. Um, and then it would be easier to search. Uh, the next what's one? the website this is on? Uh, LicensedChicagoContractors.com. Licensed ED? Yes, and it is very mobile friendly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is a picture of Brooklyn Boulders. I don't know if you, if people were here like four weeks ago and we, someone here was, was talking about it. Too. Okay, I missed last week's. <laughs> uh, so Brooklyn Boulders, you can. This is a picture uh, by Eric Rogers, who uh, is occasionally comes to Half Night. And then if you go to the next one, uh, you'll see the associated permit. And you can see that it is for erecting a climbing wall. So $750,000 for a climbing wall. So if you ever wanted an estimate on how much a climbing wall that big costs, there you go. Uh, and then you can also see who is building it. Um, OK, go to the next one, please. So now I'm going to tell you what I've learned through all of this process. <laughs> um, 
So when I was looking at the building permit data, I thought I, after like a month of working in it, I thought I knew exactly what I was looking at. I thought I knew everything about it. And so I decided to, you know, to um, write a blog post on my personal blog called Stephen Can Plan. And I, you know, and I pulled up these numbers. And these numbers represent the top 20 most active general contractors, or GC, in doing business in Chicago. And so Power was that one that was doing the New City 19 residential tower. Um, and this, this year, uh, I forgot to say that. So they've been doing $333 million worth of construction. That doesn't mean they're earning $333 million. I have no idea how much they're earning. And so I put up this list, and and like, oh, go to the next one. And so like I said, there's a spot on the application for the estimated construction costs. So I, you just have to take it at face value um, and go to the next one. But a couple people commented on my blog saying that I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so change the title to somewhat in the realm of the truth. Some active contractors in a narrowly defined category of whatever think Stephen <laughs> thinks is important but doesn't really matter. <laughs> I edited this, actually. It was a little nasty. <laughs> uh, and this person left a few more comments. And I was discussing this with him, uh, you know, what, it, what I was trying to show on here. And then um, someone else commented saying, some of the general contractors who do base building work should not necessarily be compared to general contractors who do only interior work. And I thought, OK, that's a reasonable request. Um, and she gave the example Clune Construction, but they don't do any base building, so they wouldn't do like the foundation of a large structure. Um, who the heck is making construction? I'm like, again, I'm not going to look into that. <laughs> um, so I, I was, I made some mistakes, maybe. <laughs> um, so another thing that I've learned, um, go to the next one, please. Oh, did you, did you change anything? I haven't yet, because I went on vacation. <laughs> um, so in my field of transportation policy and planning, um, and I, you, uh, I want to develop a progressive or sustainable, uh, a progressive transportation policy that supports sustainable transportation modes like tra uh, biking, walking, and using public transit. So when someone wants to propose a 250 car parking space garage for a pretty dense residential neighborhood that has pretty good transit access, I want to know a little bit more about it. And so one way that advocates like myself for, for those sustainable transportation modes, we um, want to know how much a parking space costs so we can tell people, like, these are really expensive things and they don't add much to quality of life or to the built environment. Like, this is just going to be a wall that's 300 feet long. Yeah. Um, and so one thing we can never find out, because it's always you know, an industry secret, is how much exactly those parking spaces cost. Well, the building permit for this uh, one in Rogers Park uh, was released May 29th, or was issued May 29th, and it said $9 million for the whole structure. So each parking space costs $36,000 each. So over 20 years, you'd have to rent it, each one at $150 a month. So another reason, uh, so let's say you rent an apartment, and the apartment comes with a free parking space, but you don't have a car, you're paying for it. And so one thing that we like to um, recommend is that the, the cost of parking should be separated or unbundled from the cost of renting, um, so that it's very clear what you're buying. Um, so. Those are some of the things that I've learned. I'm also going to ask for some improvements for the uh, uh, City of Chicago data uh, operators. Um, so I think with the unbundling, there's contractual differences when you rent out a space separately from it being part of the unit that you have. I'm talking about rentals. What's that? I'm talking about rentals, so not condos. Yeah, no, on, on rental. So if you're a landowner and you rent out your space and included in that rent is a price of a parking spot, your liability structure changes is if you were renting out the space and in addition you're paying you know hundred bucks a month or something. Uh, I, I think you have I think landlords have extra uh, obligations uh, on protection and, and what they have if there's vandalism to the car. So the liability structure changes okay. depending on the agreements. How I know that because I know some landlords who said, you know, 
I'm just going to include it into the rent because otherwise it's this other thing I'm now liable for that's kind of separate from, from me. So it's like a separate piece of property then. Yeah, I think, you, so. I think liability goes up in the sense that you know, if somebody comes and vandalizes your car, uh, you, you could potentially have to deal with that as a, as a landlord uh, and, and somebody who's leasing that from you. Right, and renter's insurance or the landlord's property insurance might be yeah, higher. I, I don't know about the details on that, but I know that's something that's been most, most parking garages are owned by REITs who are just using those holding vehicles while they wait for the property to be to go off the place. So they're just there because they've waited 50 years and then they're going to knock it down. But, but not those that basically they're yeah. okay. well, and, or sell something else. And this was a very controversial garage, and there were some on the ground protests about it. and. The uh, alderman Joe Moore wrote a 12,000 word response to them. Um, yeah. Uh, saying that without this, people would be stuck in their homes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a quote. <laughs> uh, next one. Okay. So this slide shows one of the things that I would like to see improved. So this is a conversation between my Twitter account, uh, Shy Buildings, Moss Design, and Late Design. So these are both architecture firms. And our favorite, so he's, uh, Moss Design, um, Matt Nardella is saying, I love reading the city's data entry spelling errors on scope of work descriptions. And then Late Design is saying our favorite, Lentils instead of lintel. <laughs> <laughs> so, this, this is a lintel. And this is a lentil. <laughs> and there are 29 of these. <laughs> uh, so I think a, a spell check program would uh, help out <laughs> the permits. The lentil spelled correctly. Yeah, it's spelled correctly. It is, but no one is building a lentil. <laughs> um, uh, one of the other things that I would like to see, or I'd like to I don't know, I, yeah, I'd like to provide is that one of the first uh, group of questions that people started emailing me about was, oh, do you have the architectural plans for this permit? I'm like, no, I don't have them for like anything. <laughs> like, they're just not included. And I don't know what the legalities are of that, you know, to just freely distribute people's structure designs and our blueprints. Um, but I think it would be interesting to see maybe cert, like renderings. Maybe renderings could be provided, like when the city takes in a a, a building permit, like provide some drawings of some like you know pictograms, diagrams, photographs of, of what the structure would look like. Um, and then the other thing I'd like to see is the Cook County um, tax assessor and the all the all the three agencies that you know manage taxes in the county. Um, I would like to see them have more open data so that these building permits can, you can do more research then more easily. Um, and they're really closed off, the, the three tax ones. Except for cookcountyproperty.info, I think it is. They actually. Dot com. Cookcountyproperty.info.com Cook is pretty good. Yeah. They don't have an API. But at least um, you can go to a URL with like the pin in the, yeah. in the in and the so system. I do that whenever the pin, which is the property identification number, which is your tax number for that parcel, whenever that's included in the building permit, I do include a link over to uh, CookCountyPropertyInfo.com so that you can do some more research. Well, the, uh, it's a slightly different process, but for uh, awnings, uh, which actually don't go through this process, they go through the city council awnings, and uh, they require architectural drawings and pictures and all those things. So we have to have pictures of awnings. It seems like maybe reasonable that we could have some some of the drawings for these really substantive. Well, there are signs in here, like McDonald's wants to erect an M. Yeah, that would be in here. Right. So if, if if you have anything that is a sign, then you're you already have the drawings through the through uh, the through the. City, the, the city council's legislative information service. Okay. Um, but so not gonna figure out how to pull not, those in. Yeah, I mean we'll talk about that later. But not everything that requires a building permit goes through the city council. Right. Uh, blast. My understanding is for the last two years, there's uh, uh, digital schematics that is being collected by apartment buildings. I operate from 
people were asked that over the part of the building to file for your request mm -hmm. uh, because you can't get those. So they are public record. I believe, I believe that they can release it, yeah. Is that the project docs system? Is that what that is? <clears throat> yeah. So I want to add one more thing that I found out through reading this data. So it's all in a database. So if you know SQL, MySQL, or PostgreSQL, you can easily run queries on it and like uh, mm -hmm. see all the variations of uh, project types or even the contractor names and or contractor types because there's like electrical, masonry, plumbing, ventilation, blah, blah, blah. One of them is also self-certified architect. I'm like, that sounds weird. <laughs> <laughs> How could an architect certify themselves? And, and so Moss Design, uh, I started asking them some of these questions and they're like, oh, no, no, no. It means that you've gone through the self-certification program and you can certify the project so the city doesn't have to certify them for you. And so you can get your project approved a little faster. But it's like a $4,000 class over a period of a few days. So not so most architects that are in the database are not self-certified. Yeah, that seems like a pretty small cost of doing business or turning around. Uh, it, and it might be that the architect is self-certified, but the project isn't. Okay. Um, and I haven't done any uh, queries to see if there's a correlation on like project size and uh -huh. self-cert. Hey, question time? <laughs> or we can save questions. Or yeah, let's do that. Yeah. All right. Cool. Awesome. Super excited to be here. This is my first ever uh, hack night. This is intimidating. You all sound very smart. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to talk about both building permit data in a different way. Um, during the summer of 2012, I used uh, the city's building permit data to analyze patterns of construction and demolition. I should say demolition and new construction um, in Chicago between the period of 2004 and 2012. Um, so I'm going to talk about who I am, the data I use, some of the spatial patterns that I found. Some examples of the analysis, I'm certainly not going to go into all of the analysis that I did, um, and some of the challenges and lessons that I learned and what the result of the project was. So um, I'm getting used to, I just got married, I'm getting used to my new last name, it's actually Tina Patrick Smith. Um, and uh, if you have any questions about this or um, anything else that you don't get to today, you can contact me via email or via Twitter. Um, right now, I'm the Policy and Communications Associate at the Institute for Housing Studies at DePaul University. But when I did this, I was but a lowly intern at the uh, Preservation Green Lab, which is a project of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. So Preservation Green Lab is a small project of the trust that actually is uh, run in Seattle, whose aim is to do research and, and market that research that shows historic preservation um, is a key part of sustainable urban policy. I was working out of the Chicago office. And um, the goal, I was hired to look at drivers of demolition in Chicago um, with the goal of getting just enough done to show this to the Urban Land Institute um, in hopes that they would fund a larger study in a major U.S. city. And of course, my hope as a lowly intern was that if that happened, I would get a job um, <laughs> and would get to work on that major study. Um, so the data I was using, we wanted to look at data from 2000 to 2012, which is when I, May of 2012 is when I started the project. Um, so as you may know, on the city's data portal, you can go back to January 2006. And if you did that between May 2006 and May 2012, you would find 263,503 permits. Uh, there was lots more than these, but these were kind of the major ones, um, some of the major categories um, that were on the city's data portal. So I FOIA, uh, did a FOIA request for one previous to 2006, and um, I was informed by the very nice person who uh, helped me that it only in a, re in, a, in a reasonable amount of time, they'd only be able to get me back to 2004. Um, when I got that, the result of that FOIA request, there was only 3,176 permits, but I only got new, new construction and demolition, but that's all I needed, so that was fine. 
So I had a pool of 270,000 permits. And I quickly realized, uh, upon looking at them, that uh, I was going to have to narrow them down a lot because I was interested in demolitions of real buildings. Um, and there are building permits for demolitions of canopies, for, for, uh, for festivals, tents if they're big enough, uh, porches, uh, parts of buildings, big signs that aren't part of the sign permit. And it was at that moment that I realized I was going to have to go through these permits um, kind of hand one by one. I don't know anything about coding or <laughs> working. This was my first project working with data, so I, I literally went through them one by one. Um, not all 220,000. I obviously <laughs> I don't have to search uh, and delete things that don't fall into like a major search category. So I ended up with 8,714 demolitions of real buildings that I was working with, our demolition permit. Um, so there were 13,334 new construction permits of, of actual buildings that I could tell. But the, what the trust was interested in were uh, what's referred to as teardowns, or buildings um, that are torn down that are probably still habitable that are being torn down for rapid redevelopment. Um, so I looked at new construction permits where a demolition permit had been issued during the period I was looking at, 2004 to 2012. That's not a great methodology for looking at teardowns because that's a really long time span. But I had three months, and that was the best I could come up with at the moment. So, um, that narrowed it down to 2,857 new construction permits that I was looking at. So the questions we wanted to know was, is there a pattern to demolitions? What, are, uh, what areas of the city are most vulnerable to demolition activity? What types of buildings are being demolished? How rapidly are they being replaced? And what are they being replaced with? So um, the first thing I did was take the demolition permits, the 8,714, and geocode them. And to my lucky surprise, about they geocoded at a very high rate, like 99%. And um, you, the patterns uh, were pretty clear. While there's you know concentration through the city, there's one area that's really, really dense. And that's um, around the river on the north side, um, Lakeview, Lincoln Park, Logan Square, West Town. So the next thing we wanted to do was look at that compared to like significant boundaries. Since I'm working with a trust, the, one of the first ones we looked at um, was historic landmarks. So these are the city's landmark districts. And the reason I specifically wanted to show you this slide is because so I go through three months of work and I do all this mapping. And um, I was really lucky that I got to present it in front of lots of really interesting stakeholders, people from the city, people from um, any, you know, national housing services. and people who work on the ground uh, in these neighborhoods. And maybe of all of those people, my biggest hero is a guy named Terry Tatum, who's the chief researcher in the uh, Historic Preservation Division, who works with the City's Landmark Commission. And uh, the first thing, <laughs> I didn't even get through this slide before Terry Tatum said, this is wrong. Um, I actually give out permits in, in landmark districts um, for demolitions. And I definitely have not given out 72 since 2004, and so that was gave me cause to pause in my uh, presentation and freak out. Um, <laughs> but uh, what I had made a really simple mistake. Um, I had not accounted for when a landmark area had become districted, or a district had become landmark. Um, so what had happened were these demolition permits were issued before the area was landmark. And what that would have been really interesting to take more time and look at, because there could be a relationship between a spike in demolition activity as an area is going through the process of being landmarked. But the second thing he said was much more disturbing, which was, how do you know that there's been 1,503 demolitions within a quarter mile of a historic district? And I said, because he used a buffer and GIS, and he was like, no. Um, <laughs> uh, what, is, what you've shown is that 1,503 demolition permits have been issued to addresses within a quarter mile of a historic district. Because if you know anything about permits, you know that uh, a permit doesn't tell you anything about subsequent activity on land. You have to go physically look at it to see if something happened. Mm -hmm. um, just because something is given a permit to be demolished does not mean that that building is demolished. Nor does um, everyone who demolishes a building in Chicago go through the permitting process. Um, a lot of developers will demolish something and then deal with the consequences of that, um, whether it be fines or whatever else, later. 
So that was also disturbing to hear. Um, <laughs> so if I was to update this to give to a um, group interested in historic preservation, not that you guys aren't, but I didn't update these slides. I want to show you what I actually did. I would change this language to be much more clear about this is not demolitions that have occurred. This is permits that have been issued. So um, we looked at it, I looked at um, permit activity with lots of different boundaries. This shows TIF districts um, in salmon and open space in green and landmarks in yellow um, to come up with um, lots of different uh, statistics about where demolitions are happening. But the geography we were really interested in were wards. And that's because of the unique um, relationship that city aldermen, or the power that city aldermen have over the permitting process. Um, we, it's, it's very unique. It is unique, um, like so many things about Chicago. Um, and um, if this analysis had ever gotten to like a, a public policy recommendation stage, which it didn't uh, while I was involved in it, we wanted to be able to, ha we had those numbers for wards um, at the ready so that we could talk to individual aldermen about um, activity in their wards. So using um, Madison Street as a divider uh, from the city so on the north side and the south side, I just did a count of, of where wards had the most demolition permits issued in them, north versus south. And um, so you see 32147. I know that unless you know the city's wards, these really don't have a spatial relationship in your mind, but that's Logan Square, Lincoln Park, uh, Lakeview, West Town, um, and the wards on the south side. I guess my point is the 31, 1, and 47 all abut each other. 3, 34, and 2 are nowhere near each other. Um, and uh, these numbers are really different. The raw numbers are just really different from the north to the south. So that's what stood out when we did that. Um, if you look at it um, on a map, so this just shows <coughs> concentration, lightest colors have the least amount of demolition, permit activity, darkest colors um, have the most. You know, there's a variation and there's one real area of concentration. When you see the new construction matching map, uh, you'll really see a big difference um, between these two, but that's what it looks like uh, across the city uh, divided by wards. So, the trick was how to show this at a parcel level in a meaningful way. So what this is, is Ward 32, the ward with the highest number of demolitions. Um, the ward is outlined in orange. We've got, I think this is salmon. You've got a tip district in kind of like a pink color. You've got uh, historic districts in yellow. And then you've got your demolition activity in white, or permit activity. Um, and it's you know pretty basic residential pattern. You see that not as much in, in landmark districts as in other uh, or around limits in other areas of the ward. And this is what it looks like in um, Ward 3, which is the highest, the ward with the highest number of demolition permits on the south side. Much more dispersed. Um, this is like Grand Boulevard, Grand Boulevard um, near Hyde Park. Um, so this is a really different pattern, as you would expect after looking at the, the concentration levels. But what was, where it got really interesting was looking at that teardown rate. So um, again, what we did was take new construction permits and match them to addresses that had been issued a demolition permit within uh, the study period, 2004 to 2012. And the interesting thing is that the words of the top three demolition permit activity are the same ones that have the top three teardown activity, Ward 32, 1, and 47. Three completely different wards have the top uh, teardown activity on the south side of the city. And again, you're just, your numbers are really different um, as far as just, just raw numbers. And when you look at this map, uh, to me, this kind of was uh, the most startling. Um, you have no variation in this almost. It's completely concentrated on the south, on the north side, um, with very, very little uh, activity on the, on the south side. So this is what it looks like with the dot density on top of it of that uh, again, this is not all new construction during this period. That's really important to remember. This is new construction where demolition had occurred uh, in the same uh, time period. Um, you know, I, I used building replacement rate, 51% on the north side, 11% on the south side. I would not say that if I was giving this presentation again and I could update these slides, I would say, you know, the rate at which you heard me say a lot permits were issued to demolition. Uh, addresses that had been given a demolition permit. So this is what that 
uh, teardown activity looks like in Ward 32. Um, really dense, just as you would expect. And in Ward 11, which is Bridgeport McKinley Park, much more spread out, much less dense. So we were really interested in what type of buildings were being demolished and what they were being replaced with. And this is uh, where lentils come into play. <laughs> um, this is really, really difficult to figure out because you have to go through the work description of a building permit to find this information. It may or may not be there. And it's really different for demolished, uh, demolition activity versus uh, construction activity. You see a really high number of unknowns. And that's because it may be that a building is blighted and old, and the people who are tearing it down don't know what it was, or how many units it had, or how many stories it was, maybe even. I certainly may not know whether it was mixed use or multifamily. Um, and the people who are entering the permit don't have that information in front of them, and how are they supposed to find out? But when you have blueprints and building plans in front of you, that information is really easy to determine. It's just a matter of whether they put it in the work description or not. So where there are unknowns, it probably was blank or misspelled to the point where I couldn't <laughs> decipher it. But these numbers were all me taking five weeks, listening to a lot of podcasts, and uh, typing out building type one permit at a time. Um, have you pulled the zoning data as well? You know, it was that wasn't available when I was doing this. Is, is the project? Also interested uh, going in the gut and refurbish? We did not look at that at all. You know, I mean, from a historic preservation perspective, that would be an obvious next step to look at rehabs and what's driving that versus demolition. But I was, I had like, I had basically had two months to, to get something to put in front of the Urban Land Institute, so that we did not, uh, weren't able to go into that. Um, of course, from, from a preserva preservation perspective, we were interested in what year buildings were being, what, how old they were when they were being torn down. Um, this came from the building outline shape file, which is also available on the city's portal, and um, super high number of unknowns from that data set as well. But um, you know, the buildings that we found were being uh, most sensitive to demolition were built in the 1890s, which and is this, a bummer. Does this look any different than the profile of all the buildings? That's a really good question. I don't know. I, I would, would in the city of big data exhibit. There's a histogram similar to this that. Do you remember all that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Can you try it from like memory? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, here is from the from the research that we've done at IHS. I can tell you this: Chicago's old. You know, yeah. it's um, it, this building stock is very old. It would not surprise me if this is very similar uh, to. I wouldn't be surprised too if that unknown it is is similar to the sure. to the unknown of the city as well. Where did you say you got the building age? Building outline shape file. Uh, yeah, where was that? Oh, it's on the it's on the, your data portal. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a shape file um, that outlines every. Um, oh yeah, okay. Building in the city. I've heard of that one. It's it's I want to not every building. I want to say it's lots. Of lots of them, and it's. <laughs> You know, it's a very, I don't know if anyone here, I'm sure one of you must be an expert on this this data set, but it's it's, it's questionable on its own. But it was the best that I could come up with at the time. Um, so challenges, hand-entered work descriptions with lots of important fields and things. Um, I, too, would have some recommendations for how uh, permits could be improved for this type of work. Building type, stories, materials. Um, Permits, it's really, really important to remember when you're working with this data that it is an, a record of permits that are issued. It is not a record of actual buildings that are being demolished or constructed, um, especially when you're talk, thinking about demolitions. Is there no record of the permits being closed? Like I know I recently did some electrical work, and they had to come and inspect the work that the electric permit was issued for, and they closed out the permit when it passed inspection. You know, I... Not a matter of record? I do not know. Um, I can tell you that the when you put this in Excel, the permit goes on forever because there's all the contractor activity that's in there. And I first thing I did was get rid of all of that. So would that tell you, for, from a demolition perspective, whether the building had been demolished or not? Or? It would. It would? And how is that verified? 
I, I, I believe um, it's due to the inspections okay. so before a permit is being closed. An inspector actually physically goes there and for every permit, you could crowdsource that. <laughs> oh yeah, right. hey, it's the building there. Right. <laughs> you just need to find that every Chicago. <laughs> We have full demo permits for buildings where we're going to demo out a number of walls, but we're not replacing the entire structure. So that bell curve makes a lot of sense from the standpoint of these buildings may need a little more TLC than others. When your vote, when your demo permits were they we're not going to build down to the ground. That's what I. That's what. That's what I went through hand by hand to make. I think sure. what you're describing uh, appears as an alteration. Permit. Not always. Oh, no. There can be. Demo I've found lots of demolition yeah. permits that were for parts of buildings. Okay. Um, so I read every single work description, and if it didn't, if I wasn't sure that it was for a substantial real structure, not a garage, not a coach house, so but a real. Two hundred eighty thousand. That's right. 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 Did you find that that histogram followed pretty accurately those those highly densely teared down wards like Ward One and did you say Ward Thirty Two is number one? I forget what you said. You mean, you mean the building age? Yeah, the building age. I did not do it on a ward by ward basis. That would okay. be really really fascinating to do, especially because Chicago has an, an outer loop of of its oldest stock. Yeah. Um, and it'd be really and it, it definitely falls into some of those. Words, so that would be really interesting to do. There's lots of areas where you could take this, um, and I, I will get into that in just one second. Oh, no, 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 because this is kind of the sad part. So I was able to give this presentation to, like I said, lots and lots and lots of stakeholders who had on the ground knowledge, and I would say if I could take, tell you one thing is that when you're doing analysis like this, if you were ever to do analysis like this, you cannot show it to people who have on ground knowledge of your data that you're working with enough because every time you will get great observations that will help you shape whatever it is that you're doing. Um, so the Urban Land Institute did choose to fund this study. Yay! Did a good job. <laughs> they did it in Los Angeles. <laughs> so <laughs> um, if you're interested in the results of that, which were done by Preservation Green Lab, you can Google Partnership for Building Reuse. Their maps are nowhere near as good as mine. But, um, <laughs> Um, so I consulted on the LA project, which was great, um, and they do not have an open data portal. They and um, they spent five thousand dollars getting the permit data that they needed to do this study, and then just as uh, I got the data and was about to map it, I got a job at IHS, and I never went back to this project again. <laughs> um, yes. The LA just launched an open data. I don't know that it has this information. Oh, okay. And since they one now. Well, the, I when I was when I my the job that I had as a consultant was to gather all the data that they would need to do the study, and literally two days before I called, they had made their city's GIS files free. Otherwise, those would have been like fifty-eight thousand dollars. So things are things are moving in LA. Any other questions? Has there been a comparative study on? Um, yeah, I saw the the age of the buildings. Eighteen nineties was the highest in Chicago. What about other cities? Is there? Have you mean just building age? Well, yes. If, if you think about it, we had the fire. Right. We did a so lot of other things. So right. Is that correct? Right. In mm -hmm. Chicago. I can tell you from research that we've done at the Institute for Housing Studies that it's a big question mark. There is a lot, a vast, a good chunk of the city we don't know when it was built because those records have been destroyed in lots of different instances. Um, so we, I mean, we don't feel like there's, I'm not that we know every single resource, but we don't feel like there's one definitive source where you can get uh, the building ages of, of, uh, of all the buildings in Chicago. Do you think it'll go up, you know, like in Coming decades, do you think do you think it'll go up that high or I mean, what would go up that high? Eighteen the, the age of the buildings. Do you think it'll You mean do you think the do I think the buildings will last? Like I don't yeah. know. More or less, right? I don't know. I feel like Chicago's a very well built city. <laughs> <laughs> you know, our the vast majority of our building stack here is old. So the chances are it will stay that way just because it, it'd be difficult to tear all those buildings down and rebuild them. Um, did you compare this to any other data sources? Like, 
Um, I know when you're on Redfin or something like mm -hmm. that, you can get uh, a house's age on right. Redfin, and that's sort of crowdsourced in a little bit. A little bit. Um, we were just talking about, you know, for for instance, at IHS, one of our major sources of data is the, the county assessor's data. But the county assessor assesses is looking for, for is assessing you for your taxes, right? And they're interested in when your building was last renovated. Um, in order to tax you. So building ages in that data set have to do with renovation, not with construction. Um, so at the time, I didn't, building outline shape file was the best source I could find for, that would take me, I basically I just had to geocode it and then I was done. Um, looking up address by address um, was difficult. But I did compare I did compare my findings to some on the ground by like taking that geocoded demolitions permit um, file, turning into a KML and looking at those um, addresses in Google Earth and kind of trying to see what was there before and what was there now. Um, again, you know, with 8,000 demolition permits, I could only check, you know, 50 or so um, by hand. But I found a good rate of, of the demolitions that actually occurred. But I had a lot of other people tell me that's not always the case. Oh, thank you. Well, thanks for listening. <laughs>